I'm the founder and director of the center, and I'm here to welcome you to tonight's program, Unsettling Classical Bodies, Padmini Chetter, in conversation with Anurima Banerjee and Brooke Holmes on the histories and the worlds of contemporary dance. Padmini Chetter has been interrogating the capacity of the body to form and unform for over three decades. Um, as she often emphasizes when she talks about her own training, uh, she was seven when she began a decade of formation in Bharatnatyam, uh, the class, one of the eight classical, um, recognized classical dance forms in, in India. So unforming uh, isn't just about an undoing um, or a dissolution of a form. It's about working through a tradition, working through to see what's there and, and what can be when the grammar and the forms are no longer given. So givenness, of course, is one of the hallmarks of the classical. So you get classical value um, when you have uh, an unquestioned fidelity to an idealized past. And in my own work, one of the things that I've been most fascinated by is how you um, challenge the notion of the classical through a, crea a creative and a critical metabolization of, of old forms, we could say. And I've been especially interested in the body um, and embodiment as a site of that remaking. And so for me, um, Padmini's practice has been revelatory. Um, it is an adamant refusal of the logic of classical value. At the same time, Pabini works with a very um, intense commitment to the forming of her own body um, in its histories, in its traditions, in its forms of training, and takes that formation as a point of departure for an experimental, highly focused inquiry into what the capacities of that body um, might be. And so those capacities realize in her case and through her dancers, um, the specific history of her training in Bharatanatyam in Chennai, her training as a scientist uh, at university, her work uh, with Chandralekha, her experimentation with uh, Krishna Devanandan, her travels in Europe, her studies in anatomy, and then over the last, um, over two decades, her tra the trajectory of her own choreographic work and it's relentless pushing through and pairing back. So uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be able to, to talk to her about her practice today. And I turn it over to Anaruma. It's a great pleasure to be here with, with her today. Well, I'm also privileged very much to be in exchange with Brooke and Badmini. And my own interest in your body of work stems from my own um, project of examining the aesthetic category of classicism and its contingencies, its constructedness. So rather than taking the idea of classical as a universal or self-evident category, some of our common work is to really critically examine received or inherited ideas that shape it. And my own work is aimed at provincializing, historicizing, demystifying, and decolonizing the classical as a prevailing genre in both Indian and other contexts, but primarily rooted in Indian dance. So I'm really struck by the way in which Badmini's work really critically engages that notion of classicism in practice and in terms of thinking through the ways in which it can still yield some kind of idea of a value and at the same time that we also need to be incredibly skeptical of this category when we talk about it, rather than thinking of it as an inherited narrative that needs to be rep reproduced again and again. So today's conversation is anchored around two of Badmini's choreographies, Varnam from 2016 and Beautiful Thing Two from 2011. And both of these works allow us to consider notions of tradition and contemporaneity, not as binaries, but as situated in relation to each other. And it also, the, the two works also allow us to consider the meaning of the archives that the body holds. And we'll begin today by discussing Varnam, which takes as its premise, the deconstruction of a central element 
of the traditional Bharatnatyam concert repertoire. And the Varnam in its structure integrates two aesthetic principles that are commonly associated with classical Indian performance. Nritta, or what is often called pure dance, which is the formalist explorations of technique within a given genre. And Nritya, which is the representational mode of dance, elaborations of poetry and narrative through movement. Within the Bharatnatyam context, the Varnam proposes also a very specific relationship between dance and music. And the Mohan uh, Manabharnam that is cited in Badmini's choreography holds special significance in terms of unsettling the classical. So Badmini, can we ask why Varnam and why this particularly iconic Varnam? Thank you. Such an honor to be here and to be even having these conversations, which are um, at times easier to have when one is far away from home, I think. Um, so I need to, um, some of you I think are familiar with sort of what's been happening um, post-independence in the Indian dance context. Some aren't, so I'm going to briefly just give you a sense of at least five or six decades. Um, beyond, I'm starting from a point that goes beyond the classical already in the way that we've known and understood it. This moment, I think, begins in the 80s uh, with the entrance of the choreographer I worked with for 10 years, Chandraleka. And there were others involved in this first moment of um, contemporizing Indian dance. And what did this really mean at this moment? It meant that India was ready to somehow move beyond its nostalgia for the past. But yet, in that still fairly new post-colonial moment, the need to define the contemporary in its own terms, um, for the choreographers to do this uh, as emerging out of their own techniques, forms, aesthetics was important. Um, and so in the 80s and 90s, we saw a small group of choreographers who all had trained in a classical form, but were really interested in not only breaking that the, the classical form uh, in terms of the way it was um, staged, the way it was uh, presented, but also brought sort of fairly like radical politics um, into the movement. And it was a very clear moment when they weren't interested in sort of adopting Western paradigms into the, the movement, but they were really looking to create an idiom that was still quite obviously Indian. I think that was very important. So it was a moment of, I think, developing identity. Um, when we come to the sort of late 90s um, in the newly globalized world, um, what started to happen was not just Coca-Cola and Levi's, that also happened, but we started to see the first group of young choreographers who had gone predominantly to the UK, coming back to India and bringing uh, British techniques, um, more international Eurocentric techniques back to the country. And so this shifted in a big way, um, the sort of understanding of what the contemporary was. And in an odd way, we started to create this kind of binary as thinking about the contemporary as something one learns in the West and brings back to a country. Um, and there was once again, a sort of a pushing of the traditional forms, the, the classical, um, into a, a kind of rigid space and creating a great gap between these two worlds. Um, and for me as a dancer, this gap was unfortunate. It was reactionary in the sense that there had always been a robust argument, a sense of friction and conversation between the tradition and the early contemporizers, 
um, and the arguments weren't always in agreement, but there was this conversation and there was this looking at each other practice and without the need to reference or to look at the West. And this started to change in this moment in the 90s. Um, and it was in this moment that I decided to, um, though I had for almost 20 years after my work with Chandra, been very consciously trying to create work um, that would absolutely in no way imaginable be uh, exoticized. Um, and by this, I mean, we'll look at some of the work later in the sense that my critique of not what Chandra did, but the way that the world was uh, viewing and boxing Chandra's work led me to actually a series of, um, of creative years when I tried to move and uh, depart, travel further and further away from Bharatanatyam into a moment of being almost unrecognizably linked to that past. Um, and I did this almost until 2015. Uh, and then I, I came to this moment when I thought there was a, a complete lack of anchoring for me. And there was this growing divide between these two communities of dancers. And it was exactly into this gap that I situated this work, Varnam, uh, which uh, premiered in 2016, both as this three channel film, which we'll see today, but also as a performance. So I think that we can look at the first um, couple of minutes. Ta, 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 ri, ta, 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 na, ta. Tajunuta, Tadimi Tatari, Tatana, Tajunu, Tadimi Ta, Takadiku, Tatiki, Tatum Tatari, Tatana, Tajunu, Tadimi Ta, Takadiku, Tatiki, Tatum Tatari tatana tajunu tadimi ta takadiku tatiki tatum ta takadiku tatiki tatum ta takadiku tatiki tatum ta takadiku tatiki tatum ta Taka diku tati kita tum. Ta, taka diku tati kita tum. Ta, taka diku tati kita tum. Ta, 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 ri, ta, 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 na. I mean, I wanted to start now that we've seen the clip um, to ask you a little bit about so much of your work has been about the decomposition of form into its parts, um, whether that's a movement lexicon that you've been reinventing. And then as that sort of intersects with your work in anatomy and thinking of parts of the body as parts of a lexicon and then sound as, as an element in that. And I wanted to ask how that work that you had done in, when Barnum has done it, you've been engaged in this practice of kind of decomposition, recomposition, games around a grammar for almost two decades to come back to Bharatnatyam <coughs> as a form. How, how did your work with sort of grammars of composition and decomposition come into play in making this work? Um, so the coming back to Varnam for me was clearly not nostalgic. That was very clear. Uh, I was a, a choreographer who had, whose principal curiosity was in creating new vocabularies. 
And the starting point for the creating of those vocabularies was often very simple anatomical questions. And that was what I loved to do as a maker. Um, and I had been working a lot with um, sort of ideas of, of time, structure, and rhythm, which to me very clearly had their roots in Bharatanatyam, which as we know has a strong mathematical rhythmic element. But in a way it had um, evolved into something which wasn't easy to, to uncover, to read. And so when I came back to Varnam, um, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to come back to the idea of Varnam uh, being this com complex combination or transitioning between the abstract and the narrative. And I knew that what I wanted to do was to complicate further by actually narrating the abstraction, which is the rhythmic section that we looked at, and of actually not storytelling or expressing the emotion of the song, which is a song, a very common kind of narrative in Bharatanatyam of a, a woman whose a lover has left and she's mourning. Um, and I mean, it's difficult to describe the entire story, but um, so when I started to think um, the jati is so inscribed in our memories, right? C the cultural memory, you have an expectation of what the dancer will do the minute you start to hear this. Um, and so it was a real challenge for me to think, what can I replace this with? So I looked to the song, uh, which spoke about... Um, distance somehow and the lovers is moving away quite literally and the, the naika is waiting. Um, so it said to me there was something about distance and proximity, which was something that I could immediately translate into this language of the body, really thinking about the spaces that could open up between these extremities and the spine and the moments that could close in. And out of that very simple idea, we started to create together with the dancers, this kind of alphabet of language uh, that I then set to the jati itself. And the other part of the Varnam, which talks about the, the actual song, the story, um, was for me where I looked at just removing the meaning of the gesture itself, you know, and just being quite cold, like really using though the as original um, phraseology that we could uh, think about uh, using, but somehow not thinking about narrating, but somehow um, making that the abstraction. Because the Varnam came with its song, and its um, jati, I think the work of the composer was very much to, um, to do the same unsettling that I'm trying to do with the bodies itself through sound um, and to really um, somehow not allow for the, the, the pure beauty of, of the music to be, to get us carried away with. You know, and so there's this very deliberate kind of almost this industrial layer to the sound um, that we've used and that can perhaps become clearer in the next clip. Yeah. Shall we Should go we to that? Yeah. 
think that there's a quality or a thought behind my temporality, which is much more to do with um, almost like a micro fragmentation of time that lies within the sustenance um, that's to do so much with the kind of detail that I want me or my dancers to consider mm -hmm. in the act of moving itself. I wonder if we should see the clip yeah. from Beautiful, Beautiful Thing, thing too. too. Yeah. And then maybe have a last, if yeah. you ask sure. the last question, we can yeah. open okay. it up. Yeah. Keep to time, yeah. Just as your work unsettles the classical body, it equally unsettles the contemporary, the notion of the contemporary, as is evident in the choreography of Beautiful Thing too. So you talked about how important it is for you to develop your practice, which is rooted in India, in the Chennai uh, context in particular. So can you talk about how you came to cultivate your aesthetic and how being in the space of Chennai has enabled you to realize that? 
and also the material conditions of art making in that context. The, the work that we just looked at, just to give some context, it's a beautiful thing too. It's a work that I first created in 2011. Um, it came after Beautiful Thing One, and it was a series of works. I began when I had almost completely I had become quite cynical about the possibility of, of change or the possibility of <clears throat> contem the idea of contemporary dance um, becoming more complicated, less homogeneous and less having to adhere to certain kind of Eurocentric conditions of production, etc. And therefore, I, when I began I, uh, with the beautiful things, I said, well, I, I need to take a moment to step away from all of these politics to just to, to really uh, just go back into something which I could think about as pure dance. Um, and this particular version came eight, hour, eight years after the original. Um, the original version was highly produced and was, um, was produced by the Singapore Arts Festival as a way to almost market the Asian contemporary back to the Western uh, festival circuit. Uh, that didn't go so well because when they actually premiered the work, uh, to their shock and horror, they realized this work is absolutely unmarketable. <laughs> so they completely dropped. My producer literally ran away from me the, the day after the premiere. And I was left with this very expensive uh, work with a stunning light designer by Jan Martins. And I could do nothing with this work. I could never perform it in India in the way that it was. So for a few years, I started to consider uh, what could I do now? And it was the visual arts community that really rescued me in this moment, because it became clear by this point that the dance community, neither in Chennai nor in the rest of India, could even recognize this as dance. I mean, it didn't matter anymore what category it would be. They just couldn't see it. But somehow it was interesting to the, to the visual arts community. And so I started to perform in these very like bare situations. And I realized that as contemporary um, dancers, we too often we give up agency and we too often, I think, allow ourselves to be usurped into things to, um, and we're not aware of it quite often. And I think that being living and working and being in a context where there's really, there's nothing. The context is what I make and what a few of the dancers who I work with make. Quite often those dancers, uh, because I don't like to work with dancers who've trained um, in London or who have kind of these as Susan Foster calls, I don't like working with these hired bodies, freelance dancers who can do anything. No, I like the struggle of actually working with raw material, um, the raw material of the, a body which is still capable of surprising, being surprised, of struggling, of unlearning, who's willing to ask the same questions that I'm interested. Otherwise, the ready-made dancer who can do everything probably much better than I can actually scares me. So in that sense, I think that um, working in this kind of context where one is always beginning and always trying to create the context, the conditions from really nothing around means that um, one has no choice other than to be minimalist. This is what I would say. I, I don't feel like I'm the choreographer who woke up and had a grand aesthetic kind of idea to be, strip it down. To, it, was, it was all I could do in, in these conditions of making. And then within this, 
I just decided to, to do it the best that I could, is essentially what I thought. It's about a constant, a body in constant flux and fluidity and um, somehow that can weave in and out of, of form um, and to be somehow not to be boxed, I think is perhaps the last thing I would say about my aesthetic.